All right, so it is noon, noon 01. Um, we'll kind of get started here, and uh, I'm sure people will continue to join in. Uh, so hi, I'm John Steger from Centrifuge. Uh, we are an uh, ecosystem player here in Cincinnati, here to help it accelerate and grow uh, tech-based startups in the greater Cincinnati area. Uh, we're delighted to, to host this conversation today. I'll let our panelists introduce themselves in a moment. Um, we are going to, given we have a pretty good number signed up, we're going to keep everybody on mute. Uh, maybe we'll venture off that later, but for the time being, we'll kind of stick with uh, written uh, interactions. So you can see we're sort of using the, the chat panel there. Uh, Blake had asked if you want to share the name of your company, where you're from, how much money you've raised. Uh, I'm assuming that most of the folks here are looking to raise money, given the topic. And then the Q&A. Uh, panel you'll also see on the bottom if you want to put questions in there as they come up I will try and moderate them and, and throw them at Ryan Blake as we go through um, and I'm excited I think we'll have a great conversation Blake Ryan, thank you for being here today first of all and then do you guys want to introduce yourselves and uh, <clears throat> let's get started yeah thanks John um, yeah so Ryan and I talked about it we'll do maybe a quick intro with our backgrounds um, and then also maybe our personal experience when it comes to angel investment too, just to give you some context. Um, so my name is Blake Smith and um, I am just uh, starting, I'm a, another founder and uh, CEO of uh, a company uh, called Boilerplate that we're just kicking off. It helps um, companies in their first two years um, of their founding uh, kind of line up their legal and financial needs um, for startups in particular. And so if you're interested in that, uh, uh, we don't even have our site live yet, but you can check out uh, allsmith.org, which is my website, and we have a section there for Boilerplate. Um, before that, I was founder and CEO of a company called Cladwell that actually Ryan and I worked on um, when he was working with his company, Differential. We worked on that together a little bit, um, but seven years ago. So for seven years, I was founder and CEO of that. Um, it was an online personal stylist um, where we uh, essentially recommended what to wear every day based on the clothes in your closet. Um, using some really cool algorithms we developed. Um, we partner with Nordstrom, Macy's, Express, Bloomingdale's, a couple other different um, big retailers. Um, raised, uh, I guess, a million and a half in angel money uh, across over 50 different angel investors. And in order to do that, I probably pitched at least 200 to 300 angel investors. So I feel like I've, I've done a good amount on the angel side, then went forward and actually did two institutional rounds um, one based out in San Francisco, another with um, Science Incorporated based out of Santa Monica. Um, and they're, uh, so I feel like kind of got to see the differences between those two parties. Um, so in terms of my background around angel investment, we've raised a decent amount of money across you know, 50 different angels and um, had those folks on the cap table and interacted with them through the process of exit as well. Oh, uh, that's the other thing. We sold that company um, in August of last year. Um, yeah, that's kind of my overview. Besides that, uh, I'm a dad. I have five kids, ages eight, six, four, two, and six months. And uh, my wife and I uh, homeschool our kids and live here in Cincinnati, Ohio, on the banks of the Ohio River. And so on that, introduce you to my friend, Rye. Um, go ahead, Rye. Yeah, there was a time when I was beating Blake three kids to zero, um, but he's taken the commanding lead now. Um, good job with that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm a uh, I've been an entrepreneur in Cincinnati since the early 90s, actually. Um, so I started a web agency in 95 called Shark Bites. Uh, we sold it in 99, watched it shut up, shut down in 2001 with the dot-com bubble burst. Um, I was CTO and chief experience officer for a few companies, but back in uh, 2013, when the um, startup ecosystem here started really uh, gathering steam, um, I started a company called Differential with couple friends, uh, Tim Metzner among them. Um, and uh, in 2015, we, we decided to um, uh, take on a project that, were, that required me to leave differential. Uh, it was called User Cycle at the time. And we started raising angel money. Um, we raised a bunch of seed rounds. Uh, the company eventually changed its name to Astronomer. Uh, and Astronomer, we just raised a, a pretty nice Series A uh, with a West Coast um, VC that we haven't announced yet, but it's over thirteen million dollar round, so it's pretty awesome. So I've been I've been really working though on this one company for for five years with many pivots, 
So I can talk to you about pivoting. I could talk to you about fundraising, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. And obviously uh, data. Uh, so Astronomer helps companies build data pipelines, um, <clears throat> which is a growing uh, um, thing with uh, the rise of like data science and, and data analysis and everything else. Um, everybody uh, uses data in their products these days and, and Airflow, uh, which is an open source technology that we're the stewards for is used um, with a lot of those companies. So um, yeah, so I've raised, I, I don't know, I don't have, have the count of how many angels or, or the number, but it's definitely double digits, uh, number of angels um, across multiple companies. So happy to chat with you guys today. Very briefly, maybe before we get into, we have like seven questions that are like the most commonly asked questions that we get around angel investment that Ryan and I are both going to cover. Um, but maybe before we do that, um, Ryan and I had a previous conversation on LinkedIn about this, uh, and so I kind of wanted to cover, based on your experience, Rye, around angel investors, what's your conclusion around how people should think about angel investment in like two, yeah. two to three minutes tops? Yeah, so I think like what's fun chatting with you, Blake, is like we, you know, we, um, I think we both have, we both respect each other's opinions and we recognize like they're different in some ways, right? But, you know, I, I just always appreciated, you know, your, your curiosity around this stuff. But my opinion on angels is like, you should avoid angels if you can avoid angels, right? But it's kind of like the advice saying, if you want to be a great basketball player, you should try to go to the NBA. Like, it's clearly the best place to be a great basketball player. Really hard to do. Um, but I like to say, like, you should aim to raise money from institutional investors if you can, um, because... Um, that's their job. You know, angels is a lot more work for a lot less cash and it's an extra round of dilution a lot of times, but a lot of times it's the only path that's possible. And so um, I, I would always say like, yes, take it if you can get it, uh, but don't, I wouldn't aim for that. A lot of people aim too low, as I just say with a startup, um, rather than aiming, aiming for the stars, they aim, you know, for 10 feet above the ground and the highest you're possibly going to shoot when you're aiming 10 feet above the ground is 10 feet above the ground, right? Unless it's a really wild shot. But um, yeah, I, I would just say that's my my opening salvo, <laughs> RE uh, angel investing. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I I feel like after reflecting our conversation, I'm not sure I strongly, I, I'm that far off in terms of my uh, disagreement. I feel like um, in general, yeah, if you can go straight to BC, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, I, maybe I do disagree. I, I think it's just yeah. that I, I do think that there's a cool thing. There are a lot of other cool benefits to having angel investors other than just the cash, which is whether it's connections, um, coaching, friendship, um, and the ability to even pull up friends and family um, from a wealth standpoint to be able to pull them up with you through the process. Um, now, that's not guaranteed, and we are going to talk about that later. Um, but there is a cool thing of kind of, um, it has a network effect of bringing people alongside with you. And um, I look at somebody like uh, Charlie Key here in Cincinnati and I'm like, dang, I, I think it's cool that he exited his startup and now he's investing in a bunch of other startups and that he's kind of bringing, it's like we're bringing him along, he's bringing us along. I think that's a pretty mm -hmm. cool thing. Um, so I'd say I'm maybe a little bit more pro, um, but there are some complexities, which we're going to talk about now. Yeah. So, Yeah. Um, if I, let me just say real quick. So, so it, like strategic angels to me, you always should take that money. And I think Charlie is one of those examples of a strategic angel. And he, and he, he was an investor in deferential and an astronomer, you know, uh, which, yeah, I just wanted him in just so he cared and maybe I could get more of his attention as yeah. we were going through our stuff. Cool. Cool. All right. So I have seven questions that I, I feel like um, I do some fundraising coaching. Rye does a lot of just meeting with founders and we kind of said like, okay, we, we get these questions often. So we're going to try to really quickly in like two to three minutes per, we're going to try to knock out those questions. And then hopefully that'll leave close to a half hour for you guys just to ask questions. Um, and yeah, so we'll do that. Um, question number one is um, this question of like, when am I ready to raise angel investment? Um, slash even like, should I even raise angel investment? And I feel like that question of this is like, do I really want to do this? Or am, do I have enough traction? Or do I, um, when's the right time to raise angel? So Rye, when you get that question, how do you answer that typically? And then I'll follow up. I kind of have the standard story that maybe takes more than two or three minutes, but I'll try to shorten it to 30 seconds, which is, you know, if, 
if you, um, the very best founders can raise a VC round on a napkin, right? And so if that's true, then you should be able to raise an angel round on a napkin in a, perf in a, in a less perfect world. But most likely you're gonna have to at least have a plan, you know, to raise. I would say you should definitely be able to raise angel on an idea versus like having an MVP built. Um, that's, but, but again, it really just depends on how, how impressive you are as a founder and how, how persuasive you are. So Rye, what makes an impressive founder? Uh, background, you know, product founder fit is a, is a term, you know? So like, for example, um, I always think of the guy from Kroger uh, who just who, who raised a crap ton of money and essentially what's his name? Uh, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about? Shoot, he, uh, procurement co company. Um, I can remember it starts with a V. But anyway, yeah. So if if you basically have a, a deep background in a uh, in in the field and you are well recognized as a as an expert, it's pretty easy to raise uh, venture funding. Um, if you're if you're a data guy at Facebook and you want to build a data platform for companies like Facebook, people in the valley give you money just because you fit the profile. So I think it's like you have to have a um, you have to fit what you're doing. The story has to make logical sense, you know. Yeah. But like Blake did fashion and he was a fashion, you know, with with Cloudwell. Like was that like did you have the background to say that was like a easy? Uh, everyone's like, oh, that makes sense. You know, you were a snazzy guy, right? but you were a data, you were like an analyst kind of person and that was yeah. a little bit challenging, you know? That's true. Uh, same, same with me, like I wasn't, I didn't come from a big data company to do this data platform. So uh, investors will generally like be a little bit skeptical of you unless you have the right credentials, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say, I agree, Rye, what you said about, you know, uh, ideally you should be able to raise on a napkin. I, I would say, it is, that is true. Like I think that, and uh, even with my last company, we did raise just on a spreadsheet and a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so we didn't have any product live and we raised $280,000 from friends and family and angels. It was, an hell, it was a hell of a spreadsheet though. I do remember the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think that like, um, maybe the first question is, so when am I ready? The answer is y you can definitely raise. Now, how good your story is will dictate how many people you have to pitch in order to actually pull it off. Um, but you're ready, you're ready now, um, uh, assuming you have a good story. Um, and so maybe I'll say what makes a good story. And I, I think it's really important to clarify for yourself um, the question of am I building a startup? as opposed to, am I building a small business? And I think that's where people get really caught up and have trouble raising is when they're actually raising a, a small business or just a business uh, versus uh, raising for a startup. And I really like Paul Graham's definition of startup is a company designed to grow fast. Um, and I think it's nice and simple, which is like, it's not a company designed to get to profitability soon. It's not a company designed to get a return for its investors. It's not a company designed to create jobs. It's a company designed for the purpose of growing fast. And I think it's really important. You have to choose really early on in your company journey. Am I going to forsake every other path I could take and always choose the path of growth? Um, and if that's the case, then you need to map out that story to angel investors of like, this has potential for very fast and uncapped growth, right? And if you can tell that story really, really well, um, you can raise an angel round of funding. Um, so, so the question of when am I ready? I'd say you're ready as soon as you have a good story. Um, and should you raise angel investment? I would say um, it, for this conversation in particular, you should, you, you should if you need it and um, you have, you're actually doing a startup, um, which is um, a company that's designed to grow fast. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, some, some angel investors are interested in funding, you know, and, be, and, and being part of a, of a lifestyle business potentially too. Like, I think that's the difference between angel investors and, and institutional investors is the institutional investors only want high growth. Whereas some angels, some angel company or angel investors will actually kind of advise you to build a company, you know, like you should just do some services, you know, build it. It's, it isn't a bad strategy. It's just not the, high growth venture path um, mm -hmm. to, um, to be safe, you know, to mm -hmm. be safe with their money. 
but the reality is like a VC backed, you know, rocket ship type company is you're not trying to maximize safety. You know, you're maximizing the, the odds of getting up into the zero G space, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So maybe uh, determining uh, whether and how much you should raise. So question number two is how much, how much angel investment money should we raise? What do you think, Ryan? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so again, the more you take, the more the dilution most likely is. Uh, the less you take, the less fuel you have to get wherever you're trying to go. And it's a really hard trade-off. Um, I, would, I would say once again, like um, if, if the valuation is, if you can't get a good valuation, take as, as little as you can. Uh, that's really hard, to, really hard advice to take um, because you want fuel. Um, uh, we did many rounds with Astronomer, like way too many rounds, like to the point where what happens later on is you have to start diluting the early people, you know, before it, before you're even in the space, you're already chopping down people's uh, percentages and that feels really shitty to everybody. Um, but, you know, again, like you have to do what you have to do. Uh, so, I mean, I would say you shouldn't just raise 25 K um, because at what valuation could you get 25 K? You know, you're not going to get it at a million dollar valuation, right? You're not going to sell two and a half percent of your company for 25 K. No one's going to take that deal. I mean, maybe you you can get your mom or dad or someone to take that deal, but a rational investor will will look for a bigger chunk. Um, so usually, with every round of, of venture of, of financing, you give up twenty to thirty percent of the company. Um, so you want it to be, you know, you want it to be as much as you can. Um, that's <laughs> I don't know if that's good advice or if that's interesting. Enough, but yeah, yeah, I I I wouldn't say as much as you can. I would say as little as you can to yeah. get to the seed round. Um, and I think you and I right, agree on what, I, what, I, what I'm saying, though, if you're going to give up 25% of the company, you want to get as much for that 25% as you can. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 It, it's like rare the, that you raise, no, one, no one's going to participate in a round where you're selling half the company and no one's going to participate in a round where you're selling 5% of the company. You know, like, I don't know if you've ever seen a round like that, but I've never seen a round like that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I think that I've, I have seen a round like that and they get penalized much later because of things yeah. like that. Um, yeah. I would say, uh, yeah, this is good. Uh, the guy, David, just asked a question. Is 18-month runway raise a, a good number, uh, in our opinion, for angel round? I would say no for, for angel round in particular. And that- um, shorter. Keep it shorter. I would say- um, this is actually taking stealing from Rye, I think another talk that we did together, which is that there, this is when you're raising angel money before your seed round of funding from an institutional VC, if you're a startup, before you raise from a VC, this is not a company, this is a project. And the name of the goal of the project, the only goal of the project is raise an institutional round of funding. Because, and what I mean by that is $2 million plus from a VC so that you can build up a big enough team to take a real swing in the marketplace. Up until that point, I would say, you're just trying to fund a project to see, can I raise that money? Um, so it'd almost be like, it's like the only goal is to get a mortgage so that then you can go and build the house. Um, and so the question is, what do you need in order to raise a seed round of funding? Um, and uh, I think Rye thinks there's four, I think there's five things you need. Um, but I like this idea of like, you need to score yourself at a plus three, minus three on, you have to have a product, an actual product of some sort that someone can touch and see and interact with and say, ah, that is superior. Um, two, you need to have traction, which depending on what your specific um, industry or kind of vert you know, vertical is, um, there are some uh, areas of traction that you need. So like for a seed round on a, a software, a subscription service, that's actually fairly high because you can get subscription revenue pretty high. As opposed to hardware, it might just be like the, the first route, 250 items have been sold or something like that. Um, so um, product, traction, you need to have a team in place um, with you know, the, the core areas of risk in the business, um, having some expert in each of the core areas of risk in the business. Um, and then you need to have a big market that is also growing that you're going after. And then the fifth that I add is I think you need to have defensibility. Um, and so if you're highly defensible, the product doesn't have to be as good, um, which is why hardware is like that. Um, and it's like it, if, if you have a patent, it doesn't have to be as impressive um, because it's very defensible. Um, but those five things, um, once you're at a, at least a 
plus one across the board on all five of those and at least have a couple plus twos or plus threes, then you're ready to raise an institutional round of funding. So then the question becomes, okay, where am I at right now, plus three to minus three? And how much money do I need to get to a point where I'm all in the positive and have a couple shiny things? Um, how much money do I need to get there? Take that number, double it, and that's how much money you should raise uh, from an angel, uh, in my opinion. What do you think about that, Ray? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty good. Um, yeah, the defensibility thing is an interesting thing. I think there, there's a book called 48 Laws of Power. I don't know if you've read it, but like every law has like observance of the law. And then there's like a, you can also flip the law on its head and, and also succeed that way. So like for me, instead of defensibility, I go open, right? I'm a big fan of open source, open core. And so it's like anti-defensible is, is a strategy for being, you know, uh, you know, if, if you get, if you have the biggest open source project in the world, it's defensible, even though it's open and available for everyone to use if, if you follow. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think in general, um, I completely agree with you that your goal should be to raise a seed round from an institutional investor to get your real runway. Um, I, I don't know that you need to have a big team at this stage. I mean, again, like some, some people will like some angel investors that are pretending to be institutional investors are going to demand you have things that are unrealistic at this point, but you can, def again, if you're a rational experienced founder, you could blow through that attack. You know, like if I, if I'm trying to raise, if I'm going to try to do a new company right now, I'm going to go raise it, raise a seed round by myself. And they're going to know that I'm just by myself right now. And they're going to accept that I'm by myself right now, but that I can get the people around me that I need to get around me, you know? And so I would, I would probably say team of one, I would only raise with a team of one, you know, from an um, angel or from an, sorry, I'm saying you need that. Yeah. You need that oh, at the, the end round. of the money for the seed. Uh, round, yeah, yeah. You need that. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think you need to have at least a couple of people, two or three people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, team, team wise. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, at the angel side, I think you can do it solo. Um, yeah. and again, if you can't do it solo because like, oh, like there's all this technical risk and I'm not technical, like, is that the right startup for you? You know, like uh, as the challenge is, if you need to have a crutch to get the round done, then it's that's like the team, your team score, your your founder score is obviously mm -hmm. suboptimal. Um, yeah. So. Um, this guy Todd just asked, as a founder, what percent should be the target of ownership? Meaning, how much should the founder be willing to give up through the fundraising process all the way to exit? I, I agree with Ryan. Mm -hmm. It's uh, twenty to thirty percent per round. Um, and so, I mean, by the time like you're able to make money with your startup, I think most people are in that 10 to 20% range as a founder. Yeah. Does that seem right, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think your, first, your first startup, it, you're gonna make so many mistakes and you're gonna be doing rounds more closer to 30 than 20. And you're gonna do a couple more than you should have. You know, you're gonna be cap you're inefficient and you're gonna end up with not much equity, but with a whole lot of learning, you know? And so <laughs> I would say that's your, your primary goal, I think with your first startup is, to um, learn a lot and hopefully get something out of it. Uh, you know, it, after you get to like, you know, institutional investors, you can start making as much money as you made at your previous job. You know, it's like, it's like, that's not, it's kind of a short term thing that you have to be uh, eating beans and, and rice or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I just think like, you know, I have upside now. I don't have nearly as much equity as I wish I would have, or I could have, if I would have done things differently, but uh, it's still, it's still, um, way better than working a job, you know, uh, for this time. Next time, I think I could control it and end up with a lot more equity when I get to the stage, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, question number three, we'll try to crank through these. Um, how do you find angel investors? Are they all chilling in some smoke-filled room with cigars and suspenders and their hair slicked back? Like, where are these people and how do I find them? In New York, there was this this uh, place called Angel Pad. It turned into an accelerator, but it literally was a place where angels went and hung out in New York City. Um, uh, that doesn't exist in Cincinnati. So yeah, they're they're scattered. Um, they're usually kind of uh, you know shy from you talking to them. They get too much interest from too many low quality founders. I would say in general, so um, it's really hard to get an intro to any investor. Um, you know, you have to be you have to be intriguing. You have to seem to be like you have to look like somebody they would definitely invest in, then they'll meet with you and then they'll probably tell you no anyway, you know, but like <laughs> you have to come in pretty sparkly just to even get a meeting. 
Um, but but they're everywhere. Uh, I would say network with founders to to get intros to angels. That's the best the best way. Hmm. Like I've I've taken money from a dozen angels or more. You've taken money from a lot. And if the right founder asks me for intros, I, I make those intros. I don't know how, what's your, what's your answer to that one, Blake? Probably totally different, right? <laughs> it is. It is actually kind of, um, I would say first the question is like, what's an angel investor, right? Like what is one? And so I, I think that the line of what makes an angel investor is not a very bright line. I have, my guess is that most people have at least in some area of their extended family, one person who could potentially be an angel investor. Um, so a good example would be for me um, with uh, Cladwell, um, two of my angel investors were Procter and Gamble executives because I'd worked on a project uh, before Cladwell and I'd worked with these guys. They were both in their 60s and they both liked me a lot um, and they just were impressed with me as a person. And so um, when we started Cladwell, I reached out to them and said, hey, um, just wanted to tell you what I'm up to, that sort of thing. And we just were catching up and then I used key phrase and you need to burn this phrase into your memory. Um, I, I think it's really helpful. Separate from this conversation, if you're ever interested in investing in my business, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, and what that does is it preserves the relationship by saying, like, you can just be catching up or whatever. Say separate from this conversation, I'd love to talk to you if you're interested. That allows them to opt in and say, yes, I'm interested. Let's talk about it. Or um, they, they're not interested and it doesn't feel weird because what you don't want to do is have people over for a barbecue and then corner them um, Michael Scott style and start trying to pitch them on your business, you know? Um, yeah, but I'd say that like old work colleagues, um, I have multiple like college friends who invested in my last startup, um, who I, were actually very helpful. Um, and then there's also like the random, like I went to a baseball game and, um, oh, please repeat the key phrase. Separate from this conversation, if you're ever interested in investing in my business, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, yeah, I mean, really, that's interesting. I, I didn't, we didn't, I didn't take money from anybody I knew. Um, interesting. At all. Yeah. So yeah, I, I just, I, I always felt like, you know, it's better, you know, like I, I just knew the odds, right? The odds, what are the odds that a startup um, returns money? Does anyone know the answer to that one? Like one in 10, maybe. One in 10. Um, yeah. It is one in 10. So, yeah. I, so I'm just like nine in 10 chance. I'm, <laughs> they're not getting their money. So I would, I would, again, we had this conversation yesterday about this, you know, like it's, it's just, uh, yes, it's cool to have them on the journey. Uh, for me, if I know the journey is nine out of 10 chance you're losing your money again, if, but if they know that that's still, it's still a fun, it's still a fun journey, right? It's a lottery ticket of sorts. Um, yeah. and people buy lottery tickets too, but you know, I'm just this rare, very risk averse person in some ways, you know? <laughs> yeah. Shocking. Yeah, I feel like as long as their investment represents the riskiest 5% of their portfolio, I feel fine collecting from friends and family. Um, yeah. And so like I had an, an old woman uh, who's a neighbor uh, at our old house in Madeira. Um, and I was on a walk with my son. And she's like, I heard that you're doing a new business. I, I would love to hear about the business. And maybe I, if a person had $10,000 to invest, would your business be a good investment? And I just said, absolutely not it would not be a good investment because i knew that that was not uh you know less than five percent of her her portfolio it was like all she had and she was i mean really kindly wanting to consider investing um but as long as i, I think as long as somebody you know has a portfolio that is a diversified portfolio and they're looking to find you know that riskiest five percent i think i can definitely we can fill that for people and it actually allows like a cool relationship um, but they definitely need to know the odds um, in order and to so do it. One question that, that's on, right? One place where it's easy, sort of, relatively, to find angels is angel groups. Right? And so mm -hmm. in Cincinnati, probably the best known one is QCA. So the question from the crowd, what's your view of angel groups? Better or worse than individual angels? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that Blake, oh, you had a lot more experience with, yeah. with QCA than I did, but yeah, QCA was one of our largest investors at Cladwell, um, and they carried our business through the period before we were able to raise, uh, you know, institutional money. Um, and so, uh, I'd say uh, my opinion of angel groups is it's it is a slightly different category um, than uh, I would say a slightly different category than, um, than like an angel that's just by themselves and that they are a little bit more institutional. And so I'd say they're gonna behave slightly more and even have, um, 
have uh, standards that are slightly higher than just like a typical angel. So like um, they didn't participate in my first $280,000 round. They came in after that with a half million dollars. Um, so I would say angel groups, I would almost say in order, if you're going to raise money, first go to friends and family with well diversified portfolios who could afford to lose it all, but believe in you. Um, that's friends and family and colleagues. Next, I would go to um, uh, actual individual angels or um, uh, industry experts who really know the industry you're going into and therefore might feel like they can know that this is a really good idea. Then after that, then I would go to an angel group um, because that early traction, if you can raise a, you know 200,000 from the friends and family and from the experts and from the colleagues, then that looks like traction. So that then um, maybe the angel group could finish it off Typically that I think will go better than going from zero and your first dollar in is from QCA. I haven't seen that happen a lot um, because I think they tend to um, be a little bit closer to an institution um, than uh, a typical angel. Yeah, I think the tricky thing about the angel groups is they have their processes are kind of slow, you know, so they slow you down if you let them run their process. Um, I feel like they're best to be a filler on a uh, institutional round potentially but you would have had to talk to them and have the, I would just say like, talk to them, get the, get the no out of them. Yeah. And then, and then you, and then you have them in your back pocket if you ever need them to fill around. That's, that's my advice on angel groups. <laughs> yeah. um, Cause they're pretty much going to tell you, no, um, they're going to wait. They're going to, it's going to take a long time, but you know, we did get money from like kinetic, for example, kinetic told us no at first, but then they participated in a round later. So um, yeah. uh, we never pitched QCA directly. Um, but I, I mean, I think the people at QCA are great and I think they will invest. They just, they're just like very, they're more risk averse, I would say, than the, the average, the average of the entire angel group is a lower risk profile than an individual angel, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, somebody just asked, what about asking the individual angels in the angel group, but not the group itself or bypass the group? Um, I specifically, I, I think this is possible, but I think um specifically with qca i haven't i was never able to pull that off that being said it was it's a little bit like passing a bill through congress normally i always would have one person who's the champion and then i'd have a bunch of other people who are like warm and friendlies and then together they'd all push it through the group um and so I, i'd say that that yeah I, I think that uh going just to the outside individual angel definitely try that but uh, I, I never saw that happen with QCA in particular. It might be different with other angel groups. Um, but I think generally it's easier, you're gonna move faster and be able to do it with less traction if you um, raise from individual angels as opposed to the group. Um, oh, great, someone's about to ask the next question. Somebody literally was asking, uh, what's your view on convertible notes versus a price round if you don't have more than an MVP and a minimal team? Um, literally, my next question on the list was what, uh, what terms or structure should you raise on? Um, and uh, so first off, uh, it is my opinion pretty strongly that you need to get the documents. They're your documents that you bring to the angel. I would not wait for the angel to give you a term sheet. That's different with an institutional round. In an institutional round, you wait for the VC to give their term sheet to you. Um, and I far prefer this structure of having the document myself. So what I like to do is I would actually take the document and print it out and keep it in my bag. So at the end of a pitch, I would pull out the pieces of paper and say, here's what I'm asking you to sign and show them. So you just have to put in how much money and then you sign here. And there's something about being able to follow through kind of like with your swing that I found that my close rate went, was much higher when I would do that. Um, so uh, in terms of what, documents to use. Um, I, at this point, I think a convertible note or a safe are both acceptable um, scenarios. So if you go to ycombinator.com and go and look up safe document, um, that's its future equity, um, uh, which is kind of a different, it's a different structure. Um, but future equity at this point, I think is fairly widely accepted, especially on, on the coasts. Um, some people might look down at it a little bit here in Cincinnati or in the Midwest. Um, but generally, I, I think a safe is a good one or a convertible note, which I think is more familiar to people in the Midwest and even on, in New York, um, which is essentially a convertible note is debt. Um, so you're borrowing from this investor. But if this company achieves certain milestones, that debt 
will turn into a percentage of ownership. And while it does that, it accrues an interest rate. Um, and the reason they like that is because it stacks up their investment above your equity. So if the company liquidates or you know sells, um, then they get their money first. Um, and so I'd say you can actually go to, um, literally it's funny, so my startup, uh, my new startup uh, boilerplate, it, you will have these uh, documents, but I think for now, if you Google it or even go to um, Cooley Go, um, C-O-O-L-E-Y-G-O, um, if they, uh, if you go to them, um, they have some templates. Actually, Thompson Hine here in town, um, they make all their templates free as well, and we're partnering with them with boilerplate. Um, but uh, yeah, so go to Thompson Hine, Dave Wilbrand. He has documents, and he can give you the documents for free for a convertible note. And Dave's equity chalk talk actually is a great walkthrough, um, yeah. focusing particularly on convertible notes, which I think, to your point, much more widely used, particularly around here in the middle of the country, because uh, yeah. they're a little more investor friendly than a safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Uh, all, that being, all that being said, I would say force the safe. Uh, <laughs> like you, you can again it, it comes down to again your your own um, ability to get done what you need to get done as a founder you want to say if you rather than a convertible note the convertible notes can have all kinds of trinkets in there um, uh, that you don't realize until the next round or even two rounds later was ever even in there because uh, you're so excited to get their money so uh, in the midwest the trinkets exist um, and you got to be careful of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be, I don't know. Uh, we spent, uh, so we had too many uh, convertible notes uh, in our last, uh, we, we did several rounds of convertible notes and um, it ended up costing us $90,000 to clean all that up after our first institutional round. Um, so there is a little bit of like a administrative debt that you're taking on with that structure compared to a safe is much cleaner. Um, um, yeah, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, all right, uh, other questions. I think we actually have covered a couple of these. Um, we just did terms and structure, who should invest and who shouldn't, we've done that. Um, question number six, actually. Um, oh, okay. It was saying, what documents do you need to prepare in order to raise? Um, I don't know if that's that interesting, but I, I guess it is important um, that like, you I, I still say like those fundraising docs are the most important docs you need to prepare, right? Well, you also need deck. to be, you should also need to be a C Corp, right? Mm -hmm. um, and well, not, again, for Angel, I think you could still be an LLC, um, but I, I would, I would advise most startups to start with C Corp. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're planning on, again, it doesn't cost that much more. Yes, there's more administration, but the odds of the company being around in two years are low, <laughs> or should be low. Uh, so it's really um, not that big of a deal. But I mean, basically, it was great when we went to when we went to Angel Pad in New York. Like, like we were the only ones that came in as LLCs. You know, everyone else was already a C corp. They'd already, you know, they had their fifteen million dollars of or fifteen million shares, you know, issued as a C corp. And like, there's just standards that the the real ecosystems have that we don't have here in Cincinnati because mm -hmm. it's like we're not really set up for success we're set up for what we do you know yeah. we're not you know people aren't optimizing for the the fact that this is going to be a real company and be a successful company um, I think they're more guarding their 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 gold you know yeah I've actually got a list of the documents that I just compiled for this new company um, I'll paste it in here if you if you want on here, I have like a checklist of the documents that you need for a, definitely an institutional round. It's probably a little much for Angel, but it's, it gives you an idea. Um, okay, um, next question that we've got. What's our next one? We've got, uh, oh, how do you run the process of raising from angels? And this is kind of our last question, and then we can just open it up to everybody. Um, so Rai, how, what's your, the process look like for ra raising angel investment? I, I think I was saying to you yesterday, like, to me, like the most important part of the process is there has to be FOMO in the process. Um, so there has to be, FOMO? if you're missing out. So it's really, again, and again, it's like for me, I'm, maybe if I'm, sell, if I'm trying to, you know, pull together a group of strangers into a round, it's different than if it's friends and family. But let's say it's professional angels you're trying to get together. 
you have to have a reason. You have to have some sort of deadline. Um, I mean, I was saying yesterday, even if you say, threaten like, hey, I'm either going to raise this round in two months or I'm going back to work at PNG, you know, that at least gives them some event that if they don't act, they're going to lose the opportunity to invest. If, if there's no reason why, for them to invest now and they could invest later in a month or in a two months, then they will. They'll choose to generally invest later than, than now. So um, you'll see this in, in, in the seed stage round too, like, you could talk to lots of investors who are kind of lukewarm and interested, but unless there's an event or a trigger for them to actually write a check, it's really hard to get them to write a check. So generally what that looks like is a term sheet, you know, later on is, um, okay, I have a term sheet now. I only have this much space. Do you want your allocation? You know, like you, you could really hammer things at that point, but at the angel round, I just think you have to set a timeline and, and you know just you have to make it you have to make it feel like this is a limited quantity that they have to either act now or they miss out yeah i think it's right it is harder to do though when it does when you don't have this term sheet or it does it feels like you could just keep collecting checks um so on how to run the raise i'd say okay i'm very straight like in order um you need to create okay uh sorry i'm catching myself I was just talking with a woman from 500 startups uh, at Accelerator out in SF, and I was just remarking on, uh, I, I'm coaching some folks through the process of raising money, and there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of meetings you have with investors and whether you raise money or not. There is not a one-to-one -one relationship with anything else. So I'm seeing companies who have worse pitches less experienced teams, less traction, who just take a lot of meetings and like are pitching in the hundreds of meetings, they always close. And the person who can't get more than, you know, three meetings in a week, um, and, or maybe is trying to pitch 20 company, or 20 investors or 30 investors, those people are not closing at the early stage because they're just not pitching enough people. Um, and in summary, I think the, the, the cliche is it's a numbers game. Um, but the reason it's a numbers game is because you get smarter and you get better at this process the more people you pitch and you take input and you start to kind of adjust the way you do it. Um, for perspective, when, like when we raised uh, for Cloudwell, that first institutional round, I pitched 150 VCs in six weeks. That's not an exaggeration. I actually have the list on the spreadsheet, 150, and I had 144 no's in a row. Um, and, that, and then as soon as we got one, suddenly, boom, 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 it started to close together because we had some traction. Um, I, so just for first, like that's what I mean by a lot of meetings. So in order to run the process, you need to set it up for a lot of meetings. So you need to create a list of, call it 200 investors in a spreadsheet, and then either get in, introductions if you don't already have an introduction um, to those people. Um, and then you actually set it up. So you're pitching somewhere between five to 15 investors a week until you raise the money. Um, and so uh, you're, you're just constantly going to coffee meetings, kind of walking through this process. And so it's administratively really difficult. We were just talking about using like a CRM or something like that. Um, I've got a spreadsheet that I can share um, that I've shared with a bunch of different people. It's just like a Google spreadsheet um, of like, hey, here's the process to generate that list. And then after you've generated the list, here's um, like, uh, how do you score those different people? How do you get introductions to those people, et cetera. So, um, here, I'll, I'll share that spreadsheet here also. Um, and it doesn't, it's not anything special. Um, like it's just a spreadsheet with a bunch of different questions that you kind of ask to kind of pull it together. Um, but I feel like, yeah, once you kind of have your funnel, then it's just working your way down the funnel. And then uh, once a week, what I would do is as I'm pitching once a week, I would then go back um, and I would, uh, I would go and say, okay, what did I learn this week and what do I need to change in my presentation um, to make it better? Sorry, that was a little bit rarely. Uh, what would you say? A couple, a couple, couple thoughts. Number one, save your best meetings for last. You probably yes, do that too. Right? Totally. <laughs> you really want to go get the best meeting now. But uh, and I went through like some sales training like a long time ago. And I remember the, the uh, quote from the sales training was, your first hundred sales calls, you're going to not make the sale because you're going to mess up somewhere in the process, you know, um, when you're, when you're selling a new product, this is unrelated to being a, a founder. This is just like, as a salesperson, the first hundred sales pitches you make for a product are going to suck. Cause you're, 
again, all you got to do is, is screw up one step of it and you end up with nothing. And it's the same thing. And it's actually, I'd say far worse in, um, in, in the startup stuff where like, if you just come across as a C average in something like you're dead, you know, like they're just looking for reasons to DQ you. Um, and so, you know, eventually you can get to the point where you can get through a whole meeting and not screw yourself uh, and then have a shot at maybe getting their money. Um, but you just have to go through those repetitions. You know, if you if this is your first startup, um, just again, like getting those reps, expecting nothing out of them is, is pretty important. Like you knew going in, like out of the 150 meetings, you knew you were going to have like, three out of fifth three out of 150 hit you know because you're just i mean you had because you had had probably 100 meetings before that you know yeah. like uh uh you just know know the game so uh but again i think you get better over time um and just you just have to accept the fact that this is like learning any skill um yeah. takes practice right yeah and practice i would say that's the final thing i'm like go ahead and practice you know practice with friends founders anybody your your mom your wife like if they can't understand what you're trying to sell or you know what what the startup does uh that's that's actually a pretty bad thing you know yeah so yeah <laughs> cool all right let's just start asking uh, let's start let's bang out as many of these q and a's as possible anybody who has additional questions start to type them in and we'll try to knock them out um anonymous attendee asks that's a strange name anonymous attendee um could you have done anything to avoid the conversion debt at the first institutional round um yeah i, I mean the thing we could have done is done fewer rounds or have done a safe. If we did, if you do one convertible note round um, or maybe one and an extension of it, you're okay. It's that I did five, all with different terms in each. And so it was a mess. So that would have made it better. Um, two, uh, David Scott, any thoughts on the optimal pitch deck and how raising capital has changed in the COVID era? Is this type of data still valid? And this is from Docsend. Oh, is this the. Um, I love this. Yeah, I like this uh, deck uh, talking about the optimal pitch deck. The only change I would personally make to this pitch deck that you just put in here, David, um, which was from, uh, it's like showing like the ideal order, um, is I think every, every pitch deck now has to start with why now, and it has to explicitly map to COVID. So it's like, and if you don't have that, that why now that maps to the current moment in time, um, cause that's the only thing going on right now. Um, then I think you're gonna have trouble raising people who have a really clear why now is the perfect time for this business. Um, it's much, much easier, um, to raise. So like, I've got a startup that I'm working with right now and, um, they're a delivery startup. They deli it's like Uber for things. Um, and their why now is so strong that their VC is just reaching out, like saying like, Hey, we'd be really interested. Right. Um, so it's not like VCs aren't investing right now. It's just that they need to see how it maps to the current thing that's going on. And that's always true. Um, but right now it has to lead there. Any other additions on that, Ryan? No, I think that's great. Like I, I was talking to one of the brandery companies and they were, I actually forget what they did, but it was something around physical space, blah, blah, blah. And I said, why don't you pitch that that was the old way and this is the new way. I don't know what the new way is, but it has to be online and digital and, and touchless, right? Like I was like, pitch that for the, again, like the other thing people don't realize too, is you're allowed to talk about vision in this pitch deck, not today, not where you are right now. You know, you want to talk about where things are headed and, and the best founders do that, right? The best founders are going to talk about things that are going to happen in three years, not in three months. And so, um, yeah, you can always flip, you can always have a vision that, that ties into the current state of things. And, and in fact, you better, or else you're going to seem tone, tone deaf in a way. Right. Um, and that's how they seemed to me. It was like, they were like, oh yeah, it was, it was actually, they do like samples, samples in like liquor stores or something like that. Like, I'm like, are people like, I'm not touching any samples anywhere mm -hmm. for a long, long time, you know, like, and I'm, I'm not a germaphobe, you know? So I just think like, uh, you know, it's like, how's this, people have this need, how's it going to change? <laughs> you know, like, how can you do this digitally <laughs> or yes. again, touchless? Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's a really important thing to why now, um, Pitch decks for me, um, it has to be a story. It has to, like, I think the worst decks are the ones that are just like mission, you know, product, blah. It just, it, it, if you can take the, the requirements from that, but instead weave it into what seems to be more of a free flowing story that happens to cover all those points, it's way more interesting. You're going to keep their yeah. attention uh, tremendously. 
Um, next question was says, uh, I see you explain the general process. Can you share more actionable tips on how to successfully run and do well once you are in an angel meeting? Any hacks? Yeah, um, I, I, I consider this theater. And so it's actually, it's a performance. Um, and so I actually had a pretty clear structure. Um, and probably the most important part is that you said, the word that you said, which was run, is you run the meeting. This is your meeting. It's not their meeting. Um, and I feel pretty strongly that that's uh, how an investment meeting should feel. So essentially when you're typically meeting at a third location, like a, a, you know, getting coffee. So you sit down, great to see you, be a normal human being, and maybe say something like, how's your day going? Um, I see that you have this thing that I'm noticing. What do you think about that? How's your coffee? Like be a human being for about five minutes, connect on a personal level, talk about your mutual connection, that sort of thing. After five minutes, you need to then say, okay, um, in order to get started, first, I have a couple of questions for you. You're going to carve out what the questions are for yourself, but it's like you need to figure out what their, what their thesis is, what do they like to invest in, how often are they making investments, um, what's their typical check size. Collect the information up front um, before you pitch, because then you can use that information to tailor how you're going to pitch. Um, your pitch should be, uh, if it's a live pitch, your pitch should be no longer than 20 minutes long, because um, the human attention span to hear stuff like this. Like right now we're pushing an hour and I know that half of you are all super bored. Um, human attention span, 20 minutes um, or shorter. Um, if it's digital, 10 minutes or shorter. Um, I, I've sat through a couple of digital pitches lately that were 10 minutes and I'm like, by the end of that, that was super boring. Um, so get to Q and A as fast as you can, but 20 minutes live, um, 10 minutes. And then after that, I like to ask a couple additional questions at the end and then you leave it to uh, a back and forth. Try not to get defensive on the back and forth. Um, because in reality, typically people are trying to help. I mean, you get a couple assholes, but like for the most part, people are actually trying to understand. So pay attention to the questions and even try to learn from the people. Um, Rai, any additions on that? Uh, yeah, I just go back to my sales training and it's like, I remember Sandler sales training says, selling is a Broadway play uh, orchestrated by a psychologist, you know? Like you're trying to understand that what's going on in their head, uh, cater to that. Um, and you have to you have to control the process like once again if you're selling anything and you just you don't talk about money you know like and and then you're trying to close you're not gonna you know so like finding out if they can even be an angel investor early on is not a bad thing to talk about like oh have you done any other angel investing you know like um tell me about those investments how they go would you like you know like getting them to talk a lot is 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 not a bad thing either like you're controlling the meeting by the way like when you're when your prospect is telling you stuff about them um, um you just like motoring on through your deck for the entire time is is kind of a bad meeting for them uh, they like they also like to be given an opportunity to sound smart and, and offer advice and stuff so you got to make sure you leave them space for that <laughs> yeah. when you guys say you know qualifying people to say can they be an angel investor does that mean, I mean, as a, as a founder, do you have to sort of screen for, are they an accredited investor? Well, I'll, I'll just mention, like I saw someone posted to us that they, they got one of their first investors from a basketball league. And one of my best investors is, a, is an old guy I play basketball with. And you don't know when you meet someone, an old guy playing basketball, what, what their situation is. Turns out he was like COO at Omnicare for 25 years and, and like, is it, you know, it's like does diligence for venture capitalists, like all this stuff. And when it came to, down to it, like I was thinking, oh, I'm going to get like 10 or 25K from the guy. And it, he's like, here's a 100K check, you know? I was like, what? You know, so like, it, it, I, I, that was very early on in my journey and I had no idea what I was doing. But like, it's just hard sometimes to, if you don't really know someone very well, they don't have a sign on them that says how much money they have or how much money they can risk, you know, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, a discovery process. And then they have their own process for making a decision too, which I think you should try to understand, you know? Um, Cause they might say like, Hey, I would do it as long as, you know, I'm, I'm part of a group, which is, it's not bad. You can mark it down as a soft close. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so, I mean, that, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Cool. Any, any other questions as we have people? Um, I know that we got five more minutes here. Maybe as we're waiting for that, I will say like, for anybody who's about to embark on this, like, um, it's, it's very, this is a challenging thing if you're like a person who likes to be liked by other people, which I am. 
Um, and it, this is one of the most stretching parts in my career um, in that it, it really, uh, just the rejection part of it and even the challenging and that sort of stuff. And like, it sticks with you. And like, I had like, I, when we raised around, it was like three months later, I was on a jog and suddenly I started to hear some of the mean things I heard from investors. And I literally started like crying on this run. And I was like, whoa, something, uh, it was pushed down and started to kind of bubble up. Um, but I'd say like, in retrospect, I'm so thankful that I've gone through that process because it really has helped kind of shape who I am. And so like, as much as possible, try to embrace or even enjoy the pain um, and surround yourself with friends and with family, like the people who really matter and say like, oh, they can, if they can commiserate with you in this, it is making you a, a more resilient person. And like, I, I think it's, it's, it's a great thing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say that some of the stuff, you know, the, the, the memories I have, the best memories I have are of those hardest parts, you know, like, like when you were talking about your 150 pitches in six weeks, I remember the day we went, we went, we demo day in for angel pad in San Francisco and we had like 30 meetings set up for a, a week and a half. Right. And it was, they were all very close, you know, in my book, they all felt very close to a yes, but none of them were a yes. And we ended up that process striking out, you know, and it was like, Oh my God, it sucks to, it's like you're fishing and like you, you get a fish on the hook every time you get them all to the boat and then they all fall off is how it feels sometimes, you know, if you're getting closer and uh, man, it's like, but I, I, I go back to that memory and it's like, it was a great time. Man. I learned so much during that time. Um, and uh, yeah, I agree with you completely, Blake. Like it's, uh, the, you know, going through the journey is, is an amazing experience. Yeah. All um, right. Let's try the time frame more? Last three. You bet. So All if right. you have been an angel investor, you would say thanks, but no thanks. You'd turn down their check. And why? What was the question? Would we turn to, ever turn down an angel? Have you, has there ever been an angel who uh, turned down and say no thanks and, and why? Yeah, I would say, I would say, I, I wouldn't necessarily say angel, but basically there's shady people in the world, you know, like there's this dude from Miami that came up to visit us. Uh, we called him Mr. Worldwide in our office. <laughs> and he was like, oh. <laughs> and, and he, he just like right off the bat, I was like, who the hell is that guy? I'm like, I don't know. He wants to invest or something, but we got him out of the office as quickly as we could. You know, he just, came across as cheesy and overconfident. He was building this platform that was going to take over everything. Like, uh, yeah, okay, get out of here. So I would just say, just like anything else, like if you don't want to be around that person, don't take their money, you know, like if you don't have to talk to them anymore. Yeah, I, I did not turn down any investors. And uh, in reality, I, in retrospect, absolutely wish that I did with some. Um, it really, you're partnering with these people. And so if, if your alarm bells are going off, like definitely, definitely pay attention to that. Okay. Credentials. Do you need to have a successful career scaling businesses or, you know, a successful career as a subject matter expert? Sort of there's two sides of the equation here. Which one do you think is most important? I would say you don't have to be either, but it helps to be both. both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's just a harder, it's a harder path. Like if you're trying to do a food startup and you're coming out of, you know, like uh, astronomer, you know, like what the hell are you, what, 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 how are you qualified for that? So you have that barrier to get over. Um, so that's where I think traction is the ultimate um, canceler to that. Like if you, it doesn't matter who you are, if you have a product that people want, like that speaks loudly, you know. Um, but yeah. until you have a product, uh, and traction it's, it's pretty much your profile yeah um the next question says should the deck contain a spreadsheet of financials or should it be more of a storytelling deck yes and yes um here's a link to a medium post that i just i just pasted it in here i'll put it in the chat too there's a medium post that i found that just says the ultimate financial slide that's where you put your spreadsheet you just need that one spreadsheet that kind of shows a projection it's important that you have that um, and I like the one that they had in this Medium post. Um, but uh, yeah, to be, ideally you have fundamental metrics and financials underpinning a really uh, great story that's gripping. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You should have a model, but I don't think you should bring it to the first meeting. Yeah. Cool. All right. We did it. Fantastic. <laughs> and it's 1259. You guys are amazing. So. 
thank you both for bringing your uh, your wisdom and expertise and experience. Uh, invaluable to share that with the ecosystem. Uh, thank you all who joined us from Cincinnati and also around the world. Appreciate you getting involved. Um, if there's anything we at Centrifuge can do, hit us up on centrifuge.com. I'm John at centrifuge.com. And that's what we're here for. All right. Everybody have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you much. Yes.